Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, <laughs> I was going to be doing this video, which I will do, probably for tomorrow morning. Uh, but then Scott Snyder put out a new Kickstarter, and I was like, oh cool, you know, hope it does well. It's, it's doing great, it's been up for like six hours, it's made $50,000. It's, it's, <laughs> it's him, it's Tony Daniels. It's going to do fantastic. So uh, then, <laughs> by random happenstance, I noticed this, and it all came together. So uh, there's a <laughs> there's a military version of TLDR, which is BLUF, bottom line up front. I'm not going to waste 20 minutes. Basically, my thesis is it looks like Scott Snyder has hired what I can only name as a super SJW as a uh, ward and spell of protection uh, so that his um, Kickstarter may be, uh, uh, they will pass by. So uh, before we get to that, I got some Indiegogos. Expendables Go to Hell graphic novel should be up for, let's say two or three more days. Jawbreaker's Grand Bazaar. <laughs> I haven't really mentioned this one in a couple days because I was trying to concentrate on Expendables Good Hell. And then here's a good old Iron Sights Two Psychos graphic novel, second printing. One of my favorite things to do is on Sunday, I update my spreadsheet of, boy, I'll, I'll, probably, I'll probably do a video about that spreadsheet one day. It's actually a lot of fun. So it has all of my campaigns, but then, you know, I've got one where I just list all the campaigns, the total they ever got for money, the total backers. But then I break it into Jawbreakers franchise, Iron Sights franchise. Um, then I do one called Fused because, you know, sometimes I have two different Iron Sights campaigns. I have two different pandemic uh, campaigns. And then I uh, parse them by um, calendar year, but also years I've been in business. <laughs> I think I start from May. Um, and it's really interesting to see uh, all, all the trends. Um, but uh, so yeah, so Scott Snyder's got a, uh, a Kickstarter. You have to do Kickstarter. Um, I've done a video last week where I talked about they started putting signals out like, hey, you're okay if you do crowdfunding. It's not for losers. Uh, it's actually a good way to make some money because, you know, obviously mainstream, you know, direct market is having a lot of problems. But you're only allowed to use Kickstarter. Do not use an Indiegogo for any reason whatsoever. It goes out and I'm like, all right, very cool. You know, it's uh, with him and uh, Tony S. Daniel. It was pretty much a automatic, yes, I am going to buy this. You know, get a video out of it. I think it'll be pretty solid. And uh, even here, you know, way down he describes the book and then he gets to you know, sometimes, you, or not sometimes, you should always do this. You should always kind of, and I forget to do this, like explain crowdfunding. Not everyone has bought a crowdfunded book. And there's a lot of, you know, misinformation and disinformation, you know, to, to make crowdfunding look bad. I, I like how, like, even three years in, they're like, I'm not paying $25 for a 20-page book. It's like, how many <laughs> campaigns are just... What? My books average like 100 pages. Yes, I have had two floppies, but I've had, what, like five or six books that are like 80 to 120 pages? So if you, yeah, so um, they're like, if it's not true, just repeat it endlessly for three years. So he says, creator owned books are about connection. Instead of asking you to trust us with characters you already love, as we do in licensed work, they ask you to. Follow us into worlds unknown. They're about taking a leap of faith together. So with this, we wanted to offer you something that's personal and collectible that also allows us to connect with you and show you how a book like this gets made. That is like perfect. Everything except for, I feel like creator owned. I really need a dash to connect those two words. It's bothering me. Um, but uh, if you had to explain crowdfunding to anyone, that is near perfect uh, way to do it. So I was very, very excited. 
And then I saw this shit. So Tony uh, Dan- Daniel says, wow, wow, wow. I'm going to assume he says that like Ryan George. Uh, nocturnal, and that's how they spell it. It's, that, it's fine. Nocturnal plus eternal. Okay, so Nocturnal is 75% funded in three hours. Scott Snyder and I are going to do a live stream as we watch it go up to 1,000. To get access, check out the backer-only updates. So that's kind of slick. You're like, hey, we're doing a live stream, but you got to back it. And then you'll get the background on the updates and you'll, you'll see too. So, um, so someone asks, are the physical rewards fair for the U.S. or will you also be shipping elsewhere in France, for example? So now if you backed crowdfunding before, you might be like, okay, I know. Why'd you ask that? But if you've never done it before, you might not know. Um, so she says, hey there, I'm Scott and Tony's campaign manager and I'm helping them field questions. We're shipping worldwide through BackerKit. Shipping will be charged separately through BackerKit after the campaign is over. Does this help clarify things? Let me know if you have further questions. And who is this that is running the campaign for Scott Snyder? It is none other than Camilla Zong, Comics Outreach Lead at Kickstarter, or, you know, X Comics Outreach Lead. What she actually was was a hand that reached out and said, No, (laughs) she was effectively a bouncer. She was a gatekeeper. Very, very far left extremist ideologue activist gatekeeper. And Scott Snyder, knowing all of this, hired her. So there is a position of SJW in which you are not only protected, but if you are harmed or fired, you are owed another position. Heather Antos was owed another position. They, they have to find it for her. Andy Corey will be announcing something within weeks. He Once you get to that level, to lose your job, it hurts, quote, their side. So they're going to all talk. And believe me, Andy Corey's going to have a job very soon. Camilla Zong, she has a position to hold, which is to stand be- in between Scott Snyder and SJWs. But here's something that you might have forgotten, but your brain didn't, is that the Whisper Network uh, Part 2 that came out a couple weeks ago talks a lot about Scott Snyder and his lady troubles, and that for years, years, SJWs, and it appears to be mainly uh, female SJWs, have been targeting him, have been watching him, and have had it out for him. I mean, this goes back to, uh, geez, two years ago. And then Scott Snyder says, I was off radar with this being the kids, the kids is last week before school starts and missed this yesterday. But of course, this. So for people who don't remember these days, this was like the the blind item about Comics Gate. They're like, uh, after a year of social pressure, they all started to, oh, Comics Gate, they're, oh my gosh, Comics, I just can't believe Comics. Well, when everyone is doing a, an easy rubber stamp, oh, those comic skate people, oh, they're just so bad. He was, uh, I'm sorry, spending time with his children. So after he checks in, and he even makes an excuse why they were all doing this on the 26th, but he didn't do it until the 28th. Here comes Heather Antos. I'm disappointed. I expected more from you, Scott. So at the time, two years ago, Heather Antos was a, uh, I believe, recently um, fired or quit Marvel editor, rocking about, you know, maybe 38,000 in New York City. Scott Snyder was, of course, a millionaire who had sold millions of dollars of comics. But this is the, we're in the upside down. This is how the comic book industry works. There are vicious, vicious SJW, mean girls, who uh, people are terrified of. I was trying to explain the comic book industry to a normie friend, and I said, you know how your landlord can evict you if you don't pay your rent, you know, you leave your trash out, you know, certain things that are in writing, he can kick you out. The comic book industry is an apartment building where everyone who lives in that apartment, everyone who has ever lived in that apartment, and the bums who sleep in the alley where the dumpsters are 
they all get a vote. They get to evict you too. So do you ever relax for one? And I was going to try, you know, I was trying to connect that with this. Like, please look at the screen. Please compare Vita Ayala's smug smirk to Jonathan Hickman's thousand yard stare. This is the comic book industry. <laughs> Fake forced smiles from your hipster doofus boss who had to work in Marvel for eight years before he stopped making sub poverty wages. You have someone who literally advertises themselves as their skin color and sexuality. And that's their entire career. That's their, their, that, that's their brand. And then you got Jonathan Hickman, who he's not my style. Probably the closest thing to a genius, you know, working in comics currently. And this is it. This is the mainstream industry. So Scott Snyder, instead of saying, excuse me, who are you? Or shut the fuck up. You can say shut the fuck up. When someone's bullying you, when someone's talking to you like you're their child, I'm disappointed. I expected more from you, Scott. So um, they've been watching him, and uh, they've kind of you know gone after him whenever they could. This is Stephanie Cook uh, in January. Uh, so what what was uh, what was Scott Snyder's crime? He um, said, "Comic scribe Scott Snyder isn't scared to train his competition." To which this angered a couple of SJWs. Stephanie Cook said, Please stop pitting creators against each other. Nothing good comes from that mentality. We're all peers, and we're in this thing together. If you're not in comics to also help lift up your peers, then maybe comics isn't for you. So uh, after saying, Hey, no competition. We're all peers. Lift each other up. Well, it turns out that wasn't actually true, and they didn't actually want to do that. They've just been, you know, had their eye on him. So Scott Snyder idiotically took a I promise I won't rape women pledge that was going around. Have you noticed every six months or so, there is a ridiculous thing that you expect to rubber stamp and, you know, pass on or you're going to get targeted? Well, now you're expected to rubber stamp it and you will also get targeted. So Scott Snyder takes the pledge, and here comes Alex DeCampi, who is just a joy. She is just a joy to be around. So he takes the, after being pressured to take the I won't rape women challenge, she says, this is cute, but one, we don't believe you, and two, it goes way beyond this to things like speaking up and using your privilege to push change when you see that nobody of marginalized backgrounds are being hired as creators by a particular office or they're only given, quote, token books. This is Stephanie Cook. Remember her saying that, like, comic book pros aren't in competition, they're peers and they should uplift each other? Well, when Scott Snyder took the I won't rape women challenge, this was Stephanie's response. While we're at it, Snyder took this pledge to say no, but is complicit in allowing CGers to work and thrive at DC, among other things. You can't say no to harassment while allowing people who are actively harassing creators to find work alongside of you. She's referring to Blake Northcott and Sean Gord Murphy, two people who have never ever said that they were Comicsgate, have never appeared on any people who even talk about Comicsgate a lot, you know, positively on their live streams, uh, they were assigned uh, the label of Comicsgate for not obsessively castigating them. That's it. They're talking shit about Scott Snyder. And they really don't have shit to say about him, except for he's a little chatty. <laughs> That's it. They're like, well, when he calls to talk about a book, we talk about you know business for five to ten minutes, and then he's talking about his life and his problems, and they're like, ugh. Like, okay. Aren't SJWs always like, okay, we need to destroy toxic masculinity that makes men not want to talk about their feelings. But then when, you know, a sensitive new male like Scott Snyder talks about his feelings, the, the coffee clutch over here just freaking roasts them. They're like, ugh. Okay, first of all, that's called, I know SJWs don't human very well. That's called small talk. 
But they're like, oh yeah, he's always dumping that emotional labor on us. That was kind of what Alex DeCampi did to Max Bemis. He was like, he's like, what do I do? And then all we can find is that he basically makes them do um, quote emotional labor by talking to them, chit chatting. Chit chatting is now a form of abuse. Several of these people were bolstered for years or actually basically given legitimacy in the industry by Scott Snyder. And they repay him by seeming to me prepping a um, grooming, emotional abuse, emotional labor charge against him. One of the, I mean, these things don't come out of nowhere. You can see they've been building a case against him for years. So that's where we get back to Camilla Zong. And again, please don't contact any of these people for any reason. Camilla Zong was a, a, a lead, you know, not an executive, but someone higher up there. The idea that she's stuffing envelopes and doing backer kits, it's not about that. You can get any, there's lots of people who would do that, or you can just learn it. It's fairly simple. What this is, is they're using her as, uh, Scott is using her as a bulwark. But here's the deal. When Mags was accusing Sean Gordon Murphy of grooming, it basically went like this. This person was just being nice to me as a way to basically say, hey, I'm a good guy. The idea that Sean Gordon Murphy looked at Mags Visaggio and said, there's one of my peers. Yeah, we're, we're like on the same level. No, Sean Gordon Murphy worked for 15 years taking any job he could get, which is the traditional thing Scott Snyder did, and a bunch of other people did, and that's not what SJWs do. They just kind of come in and are handed things. Can you please step in between me and the SJWs that need to harm me? No, no. You just put all the people who want to harm you kind of in the same direction. They're all going to talk. You welcome people into the industry. You uh, mentored them. And at the first chance, they're trying to bubble up little accusations against you. The thing is, that's still using her. How is this not a tokenized position? He's just basically saying, hey, you know, I'm a straight white male. I'm very easily you know, attackable, but we got this gay Asian female who just got fired, who was a gatekeeper. You really can't say shit to her. The thing is, she knows she's being used as well. Trust me, there is another whisper network, a new one that this person, Penny Parker, is not in, does not have access to. And I guarantee that Camilla Zong is in there spilling the tea. She's like, this motherfucker. They're like, girl, we know. They're like... We'll just add this to the pile it's just six months from now when we come after him again. We'll keep coming after him until he's just completely discombobulated. The funny thing is that when I first heard about this, I said, oh, he's, he's getting away. He started up all this nonsense. So I was actually kind of happy for him. I was like, okay, you figured it out. You know, you've got some connections. You can coordinate, you know, a publicity. People generally like your stuff. You're going to do good. And then you find out that Kickstarter's ex-gatekeeper is running the campaign, and you're just like, okay. So you've probably guessed that I was, I'm not going to back this. I actually was. Um, no, I'm absolutely not going to contribute to something that is funneling money to someone who wants to gatekeep the industry. It's only for far-left extremist ideologues and the feminist men who are afraid of them. So anyway, thanks for watching. Subscribe, make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Thanks to everyone giving to the GoFundMe, the Patreon, and the Indiegogo. Spendables go to hell. Oh geez, 266,000. Okay, so we're at 4,058 backers, and I'm ecstatic about that. But if you go to Kickstarter and sort by most backed comics projects, I mean, at the top, they got, you know, 14,000, 9,000. But if you go down a little bit, you see these uh, this knot of projects that are all around 4,100. And these are the ones that I really, really, really want to beat. So you got uh, Saladin Ahmed at 4,108 for Dragon. Uh, you got Matt Kent at 4,129. For Cosmic Detective, and you got uh, Gail Simone's Leaving Megalopolis, and that was from actually several years ago, at 4194. 
Boy, would I love to beat them in backers too. <laughs> I'm starting to compare not only my Indiegogo to other Indiegogos, but also to uh, Kickstarters. So anyway, um, Spendables Go to Hell graphic novel. Iron Sights 2 Psychos graphic novel, second printing. That other video that I was going to make about uh, this tweet, it's pretty much made. Uh, you're going to spend years or decades working your way up to the top of the industry, and then you're going to find yourself in a Zoom call with this expression right here. So anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.